I have a fascination with the classification of life forms. It's like the biological equivalent of cartography, making maps of where everything is. I've met people, quite a lot of people, I'm sorry to say, who can't name what states or countries lie over the border in all four directions. These are the same sort of people who don't have any perspective on history either. Maybe they're happy enough not knowing what time it is or what month it is. I've also known people who don't know the difference between our solar system and our galaxy and think they're both one and the same thing, and that there's only one in either case. And I've even known people who thought that the Earth was the biggest thing in the solar system, or the biggest thing in existence, and that the Sun and all the planets orbited around that, including all the stars, which were relatively tiny even compared to the other worlds. These people don't know who, where, when, or what they are in relation to anything else, so there can't be any comprehension of the big picture. I couldn't be like that. I want to know how I relate to everything else, chronologically, historically, geographically, and taxonomically. Now, I understand that most people aren't as interested in phylogenetic trees as I am, but what is surprising is how few people know anything about this subject at all. It is as if people classify organisms the way they categorize cars, whether it is a coupe or sedan, a truck or a van, and it doesn't matter who the manufacturer is. That's why the Bible says that bats are fowl and whales are fish. They're classified by what they do rather than what they are. The process isn't that hard to correct. It's really the same principle as that game on Sesame Street, where they show four different things and say, One of these things just doesn't belong here. I mean, we have people who think that dogs and cats are different kinds, and they can't tell whether they're closer or more similar than cows, and that cats, dogs, and cows are all obviously in one category apart from birds. Despite the fact that there are thousands of categories to compare, the principle behind all of them really can be that simple. Yet, taxonomy is a topic almost no one understands, and even when they do, they often don't get the significance of it. Creationists, for example, dismiss the importance of homologies and ignore every confirmation provided by genetics, pretending instead that we just make up places to put things according to our own arbitrary whim. They don't understand that a platypus is a monotreme, nor what that means. They think it's a chimera, part mammal, part bird, and that it shouldn't fit into the tree of life. They think that we have an excuse for anything that doesn't fit. But what if we found a real chimera? The platypus has an evolutionary phylogeny, but there would be no way to explain a pegasus or the flying monkeys from the Wizard of Oz. Feathered mammals would not, could not, fit into any taxonomic tree. The fact is that evolution can account for every organism ever discovered, but at the same time, every imaginary creature ever created for any myth or movie always violates taxonomy, meaning that they don't fit anywhere in the tree of life. Usually this is due to a lack of imagination. That's why the most intelligent cinematic species in the universe are all humanoid, somehow. If we were ever to encounter an extraterrestrial civilization, they won't look like us, for the same reason that they won't speak English, either. You, you speak English? I am actually speaking right, Julian. By an astonishing coincidence, both of our languages are exactly the same. It's not just a lack of imagination. It's that they don't understand evolution. Even folks who accept evolution often don't understand it. That's why every movie monster defies classification, even the ones that are supposed to have evolved here. I could give several specific examples, but my favorite is Godzilla. Godzilla has been revised several times, and there are now three different origin stories, each of which drastically change what it is and where it should go in the Tree of Life. In the first, and in my opinion still the best version, despite all the crappy effects at the time, Godzilla was originally named Gojira. It was supposed to have been one of those lost world dinosaurs left on some land that time forgot and was then irradiated by tests in the South Pacific. That was supposed to explain its colossal size and, of course, its radioactive breath. But someone at Toho Pictures thought it wouldn't explain its distinctive dorsal spikes. Ironically, that's about the only thing that that would have explained. In one of those early movies, someone explained the dorsal plates by suggesting that a Tyrannosaurus from the late Cretaceous period mated with a Stegosaurus from the Jurassic period, despite all the obvious problems with that. Filmmakers back then had little or no idea about geologic time. In the first movie, Raymond Burr's character said that Here in Tokyo, time has been turned back two million years. Tyrannosaurus died out 65 million years ago, and Stegosaurus more than 100 million years ago. But in the movie, a paleontologist found living trilobites in one of Gojira's footprints. 
Trilobites disappeared from the fossil record a hundred million years before Tyrannosaurs, and Gojira was no Tyrannosaur. Theropod dinosaurs usually have three fingers on their arms and four toes on their legs. Godzilla is quadridactyl, having four digits on all four limbs, just like the Simpsons have. There are other problems, which I'll get to in a minute, but first you have to understand that when I was a little boy watching these movies in the early 1970s, the world didn't yet know that Tyrannosaurs balanced on their hind legs like birds. Back then, people had the idea that bipedal dinosaurs stood straight up, propped up on their tails like kangaroos. That's how Gojira was. But I still knew Gojira was no dinosaur. It had to be something else, because the original Gojira had differentiated teeth, which is rare in any diapsid reptile, but it also had external ears and a nose, not just nostrils, but an actual proboscis. These are strictly mammalian features. This implies a Permian therapsid, an early mammal-like reptile from a time before the dinosaurs. Coincidentally, this would also put Gojira in the same era as trilobites, and its closest relatives would be known for their outrageous dorsal spines. Otherwise, the only time we ever see mammalian facial features in a reptilian body is in the case of oriental dragons. And I'm not saying that Gojira is an oriental dragon. It would need to have had stubby limbs and a serpentine body, like Manda, who was featured alongside Gojira in the 1968 classic Destroy All Monsters. Back then, the people at Toho Studios didn't know anything about evolution or paleofauna, and they didn't know zoology either. That's why Gamera has teeth. Modern turtles don't have teeth or rocket engines either. But then, spiders don't shoot web out of their face, and beetles don't walk on hind legs and have drill bits for arms. Animals don't usually have power tools installed like whatever this is. Okay, so they didn't really care about accurate biology when they made these movies. Now, the 1998 version from Tristar is literally a different story altogether. This version of Godzilla is often referred to as Gino, G-I-N-O, Godzilla in name only, uh, sometimes also nicknamed Zilla. The only good thing about this otherwise completely disappointing film is that it has the most plausible backstory for the origin of the monster. This time, instead of nuclear tests irradiating some inexplicable lone dinosaur hiding out on an island for millions of years, we have nuclear tests irradiating iguanas and their eggs. Now here's where their good idea went bad. This version of Godzilla doesn't have mammalian features, but they did completely change the design so that it would look more like a green iguana, the ones people keep as pets. However, marine iguanas, which is the only species that would have been in that area, are hideous, fat, black, mottled monstrosities that look an awful lot like the original Godzilla already. So if they wanted to go with that origin, they shouldn't have changed the look at all. If Toho Pictures knew anything of what we were talking about so far, this is the backstory they should have gone with. It even explains the dorsal spikes, because basilisks from Costa Rica are derived from iguanas, and look how they turned out. But it gets even worse than that. In order to make this lizard more like a lizard, they turned it into a dinosaur. It walks digigrade up on its toes with its heel up off the ground like a chicken. If you look at the legs of a bird, you'll see the legs of a theropod dinosaur. Gino even has the balanced posture of a bird, the same as Tyrannosaurus. But lizards are pentadactyl and plantigrade, meaning that they walk on their whole foot, including the heel. When lizards stand up on their hind legs, which they do occasionally, they stand erect, just like the original Gojira. So if we ever found an animal like Gino, alive or in the fossil record, we would not have classified it as any sort of iguana derivative. We would more likely have classified it as a man or after in dinosaur but then the skeleton wouldn't match. For those of you who don't know, dinosaurs are not lizards. Dinosaurs and lizards are on opposite branches of the reptile family tree, and finding the skull of a lizard with the legs of a dinosaur would be confusing, to say the least. That and this structure isn't sufficient for megafauna.
This is not the body plan of a gigantic animal. A terrestrial vertebrate weighing thousands of tons would not be running and leaping like a velociraptor. It would have to ponderously plod against load-bearing columns. It couldn't climb the side of a building for the same reason that rhinoceroses can't climb trees. I have a lot more complaints with this design and the movie that it came from, but I'll leave that and move on to the most recent incarnation of the Godzilla franchise, the one from Legend Pictures. This one is over twice as tall and several times more massive than the original Gojira, which is already an unbelievable stature. The largest animal that ever lived is also the longest, yet even with this extremely long neck and tail, its total length is just the original Gojira's height. If it's already impossibly big, it doesn't make any sense to make it even bigger. But of course these are kaiju, which means that they're all bigger than anything ever could be. They're all on the same scale as each other, but not to the same scale as anything else, and they never match an evolutionary phylogeny. The Muto, Godzilla's enemy in this film, is nothing like anything on this planet. It's like they're not even from here. In fact, it looks so much like the giant alien invader from another kaiju film that this one may as well have been called Godzilla vs. Cloverfield. The film gives no indication of any evolutionary origin other than a few glimpses of illustrations from Darwinian textbooks of the 19th century, implying that these animals must have evolved here. However, this time the backstory is the worst part of the movie. Godzilla is not a dinosaur, it's not a therapsid, and it's not a lizard either. It's a god. God. Like one of the great old ones from H.P. Lovecraft, Godzilla spends an eternity asleep in the deep and awakens only to destroy. The story implies that Mutos eat radiation. In the film they can track it through every kind of protective shielding and they literally eat nuclear missiles like fruit, metallic shell and all. I guess millions of years ago nuclear missiles must have grown on trees and kaiju were reportedly common even though they're absent from the fossil record with only one top secret exception. Now that we have deified a misidentified dinosaur lizard, perhaps the next Godzilla should have him combat another god. Rumor has it that's exactly what they're going to do. This time the Big G will take on another island deity who answers the prayers of its people. I've always been a huge Godzilla fan. That was my hero as a kid. And ever since my first cell phone, this has been my ringtone. That said, I'm not looking forward to the next movie. I'm still wishing that they remade the first one, the one from 1954, and that they would eventually do it right like they should have done in 1998. Thanks for watching.